That miracle is called the Enlightenment, a moment in history when philosophers suddenly overthrew religious dogma and tradition and replaced it with human reason. Harvard professor Steven Pinker puts it this way, progress is a gift of the ideals of the Enlightenment. There's just one problem with this claim. It isn't really true. Hey everyone, welcome back to Red Responds. Today PragerU is going to tell us why the Enlightenment was bad. Having watched this entire video, it's not quite clear what they think the Enlightenment is and why it's bad. I dug into the sources they list on their website for the video and whoa boy does this video look even worse than it is. Before we get back to the video, I want to touch on the first link they provide in their sources that outlines what the Enlightenment was. First thing to note is the dates they used for the Enlightenment. Their source says the Enlightenment started in 1601 and ended in 1800, which is the longest date range you'll find for the Enlightenment. Most historians have the Enlightenment started in the latter half of the 17th century, usually pointing to Newton's Principia Mathematica in 1687 as the first major work of the Enlightenment. It's fine if you want to extend it earlier than that, because other names pretty influential to Enlightenment thought were writing in the first half of the 17th century. As we jump back into the video, keep the 1601 to 1800 dates in mind as we watch. Consider the U.S. Constitution, which is frequently said to be a product of Enlightenment thought. But you only need to read about English common law, which Alexander Hamilton and James Madison certainly did, to see that this isn't so. English common law being influential on the Constitution doesn't mean the Constitution wasn't a product of Enlightenment thought. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton were Enlightenment thinkers for crying out loud. Already in the 15th century, the English jurist, John Fortescue, elaborated the theory of checks and balances, due process, and the role of private property in securing individual freedom and economic prosperity. So the crux of the argument against the Enlightenment not being an influence on the Constitution is that some precursor mentioned some of those ideas first. That's like arguing the Ramones didn't influence popular music because precursors like the New York Dolls, the Stooges, and MC5 exist. However, let's use his logic just the same against Fortescue. Checks and balances go back to Aristotle, due process goes back to the Magna Carta, and private property goes as far back as Plato as far as we know. Therefore, John Fortescue didn't influence the Constitution. See how silly this all is? This also ignores that the separation of powers theory that most influenced the Constitution came from the Enlightenment thinker Montesquieu. Legislative, executive, and judiciary were his three forms of power in every government, and this is blatant in the U.S. Constitution with the legislative branch, executive branch, and judicial branch of the U.S. government. As for due process, we don't ignore the Magna Carta in school when talking about the founding. As for private property, the work of Enlightenment thinker John Locke played a very important role. Similarly, the U.S. Bill of Rights has its sources in English common law of the 1600s. Remember the dates I told you to keep in mind? This is the first time he contradicts the 1601 to 1800 timeline given in his sources. Was common law completely separate from the Enlightenment ideals being put forth through this time? Having seen the whole video already, it seems that's his position with regards to everything that he thinks is anti-Enlightenment. Or consider modern science and medicine. Long before the Enlightenment, tradition-bound English kings sponsored path-breaking scientific institutions such as the Royal College of Physicians, founded in 1518, and the Royal Society of London, founded in 1660. How does a scientific or medical institution being built before the Enlightenment do away with the idea that the Enlightenment influenced modern science? If we use the 1601 to 1800 date in his source, that includes Francis Bacon's Novum Organum which lays out the modern scientific method. This source also lists Bacon as an Enlightenment thinker, so what the fuck gives? The second institution was also created during the Enlightenment period in his source. The truth is that statesmen and philosophers, especially in England and the Netherlands, articulated the principles of free government centuries before America was founded. So why give the Enlightenment all the credit? We don't give the Enlightenment all the credit. We point out its importance because it synthesized plenty of these ideas into novel new theories that are still impacting the world today. To go back to my punk rock scenario, punk as we recognize it today didn't really come together until the Ramones dropped their first album. Nobody's going to say Link Ray's Rumble in the 50s is punk rock, even though it was an important development on the way to punk. Bringing this back to the intellectual sphere, 
Many scientific findings over the last few hundred years have precursors going back to ancient Greece. Things like atoms, evolution, abiogenesis, etc. We recognize those early thinkers, but it isn't until we have a theory of evolution that we recognize the significance of Darwin and Wallace, for example. All this is why the Enlightenment is looked upon so fondly. Apparently, because it doesn't look good to admit that the best and most important parts of modernity were given to us by individuals who nearly all held conservative religious and political beliefs. I'll just say it's unwise to use today's conception of conservatism and apply it to intellectuals from hundreds of years ago. We'll find that several of the intellectuals aren't the conservatives see claims they are. The claim that all good things come from the Enlightenment is most closely associated with the late 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. For Kant, reason is universal, infallible, and independent of experience. His extraordinarily dogmatic philosophy insisted that there can be only one correct answer to every question in science, morality, and politics, and that to reach the one correct answer, mankind had to free itself from the chains of the past, that is, from history, tradition, and experience. I don't know where he's getting Kant suggesting all the best things came from the Enlightenment. I assume it's from Kant's answer to the question, what is Enlightenment? But Kant's answer doesn't say that at all. He comes out and says they still have a long way to go to reach in an enlightened age, so they're only living in an age of enlightenment. The three properties of reason, for lack of a better term, that are provided as Kant's view of reason are also weird. I assume the universal claim comes from Kant's view that everything works back to reason, including empiricism. Our minds may gain some understanding of the world from sense experience, but it isn't until you apply reason categories that you make sense of things. The infallibility claim refers to apodictic certainty of logical and mathematical proofs. But that isn't the same as saying human reason is infallible. Kant is plenty aware of fallible human reason in his critique of pure reason. The final claim refers to a priori knowledge, or knowledge that isn't reliant upon experience for their truth. In the critique of pure reason, Kant is trying to demonstrate that synthetic a priori knowledge can exist which goes beyond the analytic and a priori knowledge of logical and mathematical proofs. Having dug through the sources for the video, PragerU is trying to set up the Enlightenment thinkers as extreme rationalists, whereas conservative thinkers were extreme empiricists. Both rationalism and empiricism were a part of Enlightenment thought, and you didn't have to be one to the exclusion of the other. Finally, the chains that had to be thrown off for Enlightenment didn't mean you couldn't reason about history, tradition, or experience. To be enlightened or go through enlightenment, according to Kant, was to reason for yourself instead of deferring to the power structures in society to do it for you. But this enlightenment view is not only wrong, it's dangerous. Human reason, when cut loose from the constraints imposed by history, tradition, and experience, produces a lot of crazy notions. The abstract enlightenment philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a good example. It quickly pulled down the French state, leading to the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror, and the Napoleonic Wars. Millions died as Napoleon's army sought to rebuild every government in Europe in light of the one correct political theory he believed was permitted by Enlightenment philosophy. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. I've never seen or heard anything about Napoleon being an individual on a crusade to spread the one true Enlightenment government. That's so anti-Enlightenment it's ridiculous. It's also weird to use Rousseau and suggest that Napoleon is what Rousseau was advocating for. Those of Rousseau's ideas that helped lead to the fall of the French monarchy are the social contract and consent of the governed, the same type of language used with the American Revolution. Mazzoni goes on to throw communism and Nazism at the foot of reason. Because of course Prager you can't avoid tying everything they don't like to the atrocities committed by communists and fascist regimes. I'm not going to bother with that portion of the video. We're already way off the rails. The Enlightenment's critics, including John Selden, David Hume, Adam Smith, and Edmund Burke, emphasized the unreliability of abstract reasoning and urged us to stick close to custom, history, and experience in all things. Now we finally have a situation where he's using a longer period for the Enlightenment to create his list of critics of the Enlightenment. If we use the dates he's using the other examples instead of his source, John Selden died before the Enlightenment. How is he a critic of the Enlightenment? 
The next two are absolutely hilarious as they're two of the biggest figures of the Enlightenment, especially the Scottish Enlightenment. They are included simply because PragerU wants to say the Enlightenment only included extreme rationalists, while any empiricists weren't a part of the Enlightenment. It's par for the course with Mr. Hazany, as his definition of nationalism in his book, The Virtue of Nationalism, means that zero nationalist states have ever existed. It's shitty revisionism to push his political agenda. Which brings us to the heart of what's wrong with today's idolization of the Enlightenment. Its leading figures were not skeptics, open to what history and experience might teach us. Their aim was to create their own system of supposedly infallible truths independent of experience. And in that pursuit, they were as rigid as the most dogmatic medievals. Bullshit! As previously pointed out, Enlightenment thinkers, including the more rationalist leaning ones, still used history and experience in their work. Anglo Scottish conservatives had a very different goal. They defended national and religious tradition, even as they cultivated what they called a moderate skepticism, a combination that became known as common sense. This is not what Scottish common sense was. This was a philosophical position that arose out of responses to the writings of John Locke, George Berkeley, and David fucking Hume. The fact you're trying to pin a philosophical movement on one of the people that movement was arguing against shows how completely bunk your position is. That isn't to say that this movement during the Scottish Enlightenment was criticism of the Enlightenment as a whole, or rather a different branch of it. While it was a rebuttal of Hume's skepticism, it still incorporated the works of Bacon and Newton. I think a lot about common sense these days, as I see American and European elites clamoring for enlightenment now. They rush to embrace every fashionable new ism, socialism, feminism, environmentalism, and so on, declaring them to be universal certainties and the only politically correct way of thinking. What's funny is Pinker, whose book Enlightenment Now you've been responding to, would agree with you on socialism and certain feminist and environmentalist movements. I'm confused as to what universal certainties you think they are if the Enlightenment idolizer you're responding to doesn't accept them as such. I don't know what else to say about this trash video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you're new and want to see more, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to turn on notifications.